morning. Good, good. Well, I'm up here in a different role this morning, obviously. Brady is out traveling with his uh, family, getting uh, Lizzie off to school. And so uh, I have the opportunity to be up here in a different function, a different form. So I'm excited for the opportunity. But more importantly, I'm just wanted to kind of, before we get started, just to express a small bit of thanks. We've been in Albuquerque for about three months now, and it's been really exciting. It's been really fun. Uh, but more importantly, I think that working with the different ministry teams, the ministry leaders, the elders, and the staff here has been a true joy. And so my encouragement to y'all over the next week, make sure you reach out to, uh, if you serve in a ministry, reach out to a ministry leader. Reach out to your elders. Reach out to Brady when he gets back in town. And just let him know much you do appreciate him because they do some amazing work here. And I'm just excited to serve alongside so many of you guys as you're doing some really cool things for the kingdom of God. Um, but over the last couple of weeks, we've been in this uh, uh, sermon series of community. We talked about community with kids community with church, and this week we're going to talk about community with youth. Um, God's kingdom is super interesting because it is the most multicultural, most diverse, most you know, multi-ethnic kind of organization ever to exist. All people groups, all languages, all nations are all encouraged to come together to worship one person that is the person of God. And uh, it's, it's just a cool experience to be part of, all right? And that's what community is about. We're trying to create here at first and every church that meets on Sunday mornings all across the world is saying, hey, all who are welcome, all are encouraged to be here in relationship, in community. And that's what we're striving to do here. Um, and that is by God's design. God has created each one of us and he wants to include each one of us. And so that's what we're going to be continuing to work through here. But before we get into the heavy stuff, I'm going to throw it out some trivia questions. And if you know it, you can yell it out. And if not, we'll just keep on moving forward. I got four of them that just kind of get us warmed up a little bit. So the first one is, which book of the Old Testament has the least number of chapters? Totally random stuff here. Anyone have a guess? Obadiah, all right, heard it there, very good. All right, the next one, this is even the most tricky one, all right? Who is the second, second oldest living person in the Bible? No, no, no one takes second place. No one cares about second place, right? It's Jared. I just found this online. Don't. All right, here's the easy ones. These are softball toss-ups for you. What is the longest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 119 goes, goes to the Hebrew alphabet, talking about the law, all right? And the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, all right? And that's what we're going to be studying today. That's kind of why I led into this. We're going to be talking about the, the Bible verse of Jesus wept. But before we do that, I'm going to ask uh, for the Lord's blessing on this time and as we study his word. Let us pray. Dearly, Father, we come before you and we just thank you for the time that we can be in your word, study about your son, Jesus Christ his impact on the people around him, and his impact through, uh, for all of eternity. And um, we just help us to open our hearts, our minds, that we may receive it and learn to follow you more passionately by the word that is uh, read and received today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so for the most part today, I'm going to be in John 11. Um, there's, I'm going to have a couple other verses, but if you're wanting to follow along, John 11, we're going to go through a good part of this chapter here. Um, and so as you turn there, uh, I'll kind of give you a brief intro. So this is about a guy named Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, and those two sisters are Mary and Martha. And many of y'all have been in the Bible for a long time, know about Mary and Martha. The bigger, more well-known story is Mary and Martha invited Jesus over for dinner. They were working on doing some preparations Mary is at the foot of Jesus, learning from him and kind of soaking up this time. Martha's in the kitchen cooking and cleaning and getting frustrated that she's doing all the work by herself. So she kind of does a little complaint to Jesus. And Jesus replies, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Uh, um, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. So that's kind of a little bit of background. So these individuals, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, are kind of important people in the ministry of Jesus. Um, and so that's what we're going to read about, kind of give you a little bit of background. I'm going to read the first, um, let's see here, six, six, seven verses here, and then we'll jump into it. Now there was a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. 
This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, was sick he stayed there where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judea. Um, several key things I want to point out here. One is that, as I already kind of mentioned, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus had a key relationship with Jesus. Two times in this passage, it talks about the love relationship that Jesus had for these individuals. Because once he said he loved Jesus, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and then when they even sent message to Jesus, he said, hey, the one that you love is sick. All right? Um, so there's this, this special connection. And we don't know really know why Lazarus was sick. It could have been a myriad of different um, illnesses that were present in Jesus' day. We just know there was a sickness that ultimately led to him passing away. Um, and then the other thing that was key to note is that Jesus, we're, we're interacting with this story today, was not in Judea when it happened because he, he said he had to travel back to Judea. So most likely he was a considerable ways away, probably about a day's travel away from Bethany where Lazarus was current, currently at. But the biggest question when I read this story is like, why did Jesus wait two days before going back? Because like he said, like, so we already established there's a strong relationship. We established he's not really close. We know that it's a sickness that, as we know the story, he ends in death. But it's like, okay, why did he delay? Why, why two more de- days in where he was at? And it, scripture doesn't fully clearly answer that. And I think that leads us into our first point of how we connect in community. We connect in community because we all have these difficult questions when we encounter Scripture. When we encounter this real life of applying God and following Jesus in our life, there's a lot of questions that come up. It's like, okay, why does God do this? Why does God let this happen? And today's youth are asking those same questions. In fact, some of the questions that they have we didn't have to deal with at all. I mean, there's questions about, you know, sexuality. There's uh, questions about identity, substance abuse, mental health, things that we, we didn't really have to encounter on the level that youth are encountering that today. They don't have to deal with all those questions. They're having to still deal with those same big questions of God's timing. Who is God? Who is Jesus Christ? And why do all these different things happen the way they do? But I think one of the things that we have to do when we're creating community, when we're trying to connect with youth, we have to say, hey, we have these same questions. Not a single person in this room has all the answers to these difficult life questions. And that's the thing that we have in common, and that's what creates community. Even Mary and Martha struggle with these questions. <clears throat> but the interesting thing is, their questions didn't come out as questions. They came out as statements. I'm going to have you guys jump down to verse 17. And um, we'll read here. It says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss of their brother. When Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know now that God, now, now God will give you whatever you ask. I'm going to have you jump down to verse 28 and have the same conversation that Mary has with Jesus. It's very similar. And Jesus said to this, She went back and called to her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not entered, yet entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting noticed how quickly she got and went out, They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That same phrase. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, Mary and Martha are making two statements here. First is they say, hey, if you were here, if you were present, none of this would happen. 
So they're almost like saying, you were far away, and that's why some of these bad things happened. They were kind of coming up with their own solutions, maybe. Um, but one, one of the key things that they are mentioning is say, hey, that Jesus did have the power to prevent this death. They're acknowledging, saying, hey, if, if you were here, you could have done something. We knew that you had the power, you had the ability, you had been sent by God to do and fix things like this. You could have prevented this sickness. So they acknowledge that. But the problem is, is that they forgot to realize that Jesus has the power to do these things remotely. Jesus doesn't have to be physically present to heal somebody. And we see this earlier on in the book of John. John chapter 4, there's a story about a, uh, a guy who is healed, an official son is healed, and it's, he's healed remotely. He's not with the son when he heals him. He just basically says the word. The official goes back home, and the very moment that Jesus said that his son would be healed, he was healed back at home. So it happens remotely. And the problem is, is that when we are in the midst of difficult times, of trials, and, and when we have the sorrow is almost overwhelming, we forget the promises of God. Because our emotions just kind of wrap us up. Our questions are so deep, they're so strong that we forget the very nature of who God is. And I think that's probably might be what happened with, with Mary and Martha. And at first, when, when we have these conversations with one another in community, when we're struggling with these difficult questions and we have a, a friend, you know, a, a small group, you know, for someone in our small group that's struggling with these things, we have to go, okay, let's remind ourselves of the very promises of God. I'm going to read a couple out that kind of apply to a, a lot of different things here. Isaiah 41 says, Do not fear, I will be with you. Deuteronomy 31 says, He will never leave you. I will never, I will never forsake you. John 16 says, Take heart, I have overcome the world. Matthew 11, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. When we're struggling with the difficult life question, to remind each other of promises of God. Remind ourselves that there's nothing too difficult for God. That He can do things remotely. He can do things with the very spoken word. God is more than capable. But let's go back to that question. Why did Jesus wait two days? Why, why did He delay? Well, when we read in verse 17... Um, it says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So, let's do a little bit of math here. Let's kind of work through the situation. That it was customary when someone died in, it, in this time period in Israel, they were usually buried on the same day that they passed away. So that would be like day one, all right? And there was like this, this kind of tradition or kind of cultural thought um, that... And I'm going to read what a rabbi had wrote, uh, kind of described at one point. It says, the, the whole strength of the mourning process, you know, them being on the, in, in the grave, is not until the third day. For three days long, the soul remains in the grave, thinking that it will return into the body. However, it sees the color of its face has changed and will go away and leave. And a lot of this was kind of like this idea that, hey, sometimes, because they didn't have all the medical advances that we do today, that they would kind of think somebody's dead and then like maybe a day later they would kind of revive or something like that because there's a lot of weird sicknesses and illnesses that kind of really slow your heart rate down. Remember Ro Romeo and Juliet, that's what happened there. She took some potion that slowed her breath down. She wasn't really dead, but everyone thought she was. Same thing, is they came up with these practices and I remember hearing other stories about how when they would bury people, they'd drop a string down with a bell at the top, in case they woke up in the grave, they would ring the bell and say, hey, I'm not dead, I'm not dead. This is kind of the practice they had put in back then. That they had a period of mourning for three and four days to make sure. But by the third day, if someone hasn't started like reviving themselves after three days, they were pretty much dead, all right? There, there was a, that all that hope and all that, that, that desire for resurrection had gone. So... 
all hope of that was gone when Jesus arrived on day number four. So when Jesus shows up to raise Lazarus from the dead, it is a genuine resurrection. It's not some parlor trick. It's not like, oh, well, they're only sleeping. It is a genuine resurrection. There was probably a smell, a stench. There was probably a discoloration of the body. Um, and it's almost equivalent to today. If you were in a hospital and you were hooked up to all the, the medical devices and they had the, all the, your heart rate and breath rate and everything displayed on the screens in the hospital room, you flatlined, you're done, doctor comes in, checks everything out, declares you dead, they stick you somewhere else for 24 hours, and then that's a resurrection. That would be similar, more similar to what's happening here with Lazarus. It was someone who was fully, fully dead. But I think that helps us explain the two days. Because the messenger, you just put this in a timeline here, Lazarus is, is sick. Mary and Martha realize, that, hey, he, he's, he's pretty rough. So they send a messenger that takes one day to get to Jesus. Most likely, in that one-day trip, Lazarus passes away. Day one. Jesus hears that. And if he would have went back on day two, it would have been just like, well, maybe he wasn't fully dead. Jesus delays two days, so making it day two and three. On day three, he says, okay, we'll go back to Judea. Goes back. So on day four, he's going back at a delayed rate to prove that he can raise Lazarus from the dead even when he's completely, without a doubt, dead. And it brings us back to this verse here. It's for the glory of God so that God's Son may be glorified through it. That's why he waited. To show the full power and strength of Jesus Christ. God's timing is perfect. And we, we struggle with this because we believe our timing is right. I know best. I know when things should be done and how they should be done. But this story is about saying God's timing is perfect in this. When he delays and when there's a waiting period, it's for a reason. God does things for his glory and to show his power. Um. Because here, here it is, guys, that you, we have, we, we, we think, okay, what, why is this waiting to, why is there a delay in this restoration? Why is there a delay in this restored relationship? Why is there a delay in my healing? Why is there a delay in knowing the, the end of the story? It's because God's wanting a full restoration. He's wanting full healing. He wants the full relationship to be, he doesn't want it partial. And sometimes it takes time to have that process. It takes time to grow. It takes time to mature. It takes time to... That's God's timing. He understands what's going on behind the scenes. And though, even though Jesus was, had this master plan of waiting and, and, and to go back to, to heal Lazarus and to fully display his resurrection power, um, he wasn't immune and he wasn't... like he, he still understood that there was some serious sorrow happening here on the scene. Even though the timing was perfect and there was a plan, people were still struggling with the death of Lazarus. And we, and we read this in the story a little bit more. Um, in verse 33, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, talking about Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied, there's that shortest verse, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Once again, it's that, it's that hey, I, he can prevent death. And Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Um... Not only did Jesus weep, which is an important thing, he had physical emotions and physical tears at this point. There's some, a couple of other words that stand out to me. He was deeply moved by the Spirit and troubled. And then later on, when he goes to the tomb, he's once more, 
he was deeply moved. And I think that's one of the things we have to understand as we're trying to create community here. And we are, especially when we're trying to commu- commu- community with multi-generational type stuff, is that we have to realize that other people's emotions and what they're struggling and what they're going through is real. And it's only when we connect with those emotions and what they're feeling and what they're experience does that true community really start to happen. Because we can say we have all the answers. We can say we understand the questions. But until we feel what they're feeling and, and, and relate to what they're going through, they have a, that, that connection, that community is not made. Digging deeper, when I think of, I looked at this word a little bit more about this troubled word. It was really, really interesting to me um, because this word troubled is only used in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in relation to other people. A couple examples of how this word troubled is used. Herod was troubled when he found out about the birth of Jesus because he was, he was the king of the Jews and heard about this other king, right? Um, the disciples were troubled when they saw Jesus walking out in the water to them. And they were troubled because at first they thought like this, this ghost, there was a spirit walking out on the water and that'd be freaky. Anyway, so they were troubled when they saw that. Zechariah was troubled when an angel had appeared to him. I would be pretty, pretty troubled if an angel appeared to me as well. And the disciples were troubled when a post-resurrected Jesus magically appeared in their presence. He just kind of like, you know, in the spirit appeared to them. And it troubled him because it was just, it's kind of one of those things you don't know how to deal with it. John is the only gospel writer that uses this word troubled, um, this Greek word, for Jesus. And I think he dives into the deeper emotions on what's going on with Jesus. Um, there's a couple ways to look at this. One is that um, he was troubled because the people who were mourning for Lazarus didn't have the faith in resurrection. And I think that's plausible. That when he saw that, hey, these people are so upset, they're, they're so enveloped in this moment and they're not seeing the bigger picture that probably brought him a little bit of sorrow and I think as we relate we think of 1 Thessalonians 4 13 brothers and sisters we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope because these people Mary Martha and, and the Jews surrounding they were grieving like they did not have hope so that's possible why he might have been troubled the other reason that he was probably troubled was because they were troubled. And I think that's part of the, like I said earlier, it's the huge part of community, is that we need to be upset. We need to be troubled. We need to be concerned when other people are upset, concerned, or troubled. That is our connecting point with those people. And even the crowds recognized this. They said, the Jews said, see how Jesus, he, see how he loved them. They could see by his tears, by his emotional outburst, that he loved Lazarus. He loved Mary and Martha, and he loved the Jews in that surrounding area. He was passionate about those people, and people could see that because he was upset. Growing up in my home church, we went to um, a, a thing called Georgia Christian Youth Convention. It was basically a convention of all the Christian churches. They would get together, put on a conference. It was at Hilton Head Island, which is on the coast of uh, the Atlantic coast in South Carolina. So a lot of people would just come because it's a beach trip. But what they didn't tell you is the beach trip was in February. So the water was like 50 degrees. And so only like three of us would actually get in the water. The rest of us just kind of pointed and laughed. Um, so, but at one of these retreats, I remember I was struggling with a lot of different things. You know, just, I was a teenager struggling with teenage things, identity, um, and I, I was missing, I don't know, I was just struggling with a lot of things. And I remember coming out of one of the sessions and seeing my youth minister and just embracing him in a hug, and I just broke down in tears. And I remember him having tears in his eyes as well, and we had conversations about what was going in my life. But it, at that, is there's one of those moments that because we shared tears, because we had that embrace, I knew that he cared. That was part of that community, is that we, we know that we, we love each other through our emotions. And it, it made me 
appreciate his teaching, his discipleship, and his leadership more. There's an old saying by Teddy Roosevelt, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that, that goes into what's happening in Jesus. They knew how, they understood Jesus cared for them and they could be more responsive to what he was teaching them. To have community today, we, we, we have to embrace all these principles that we're talking about. Um, and all these emotions, all these deep conversations that we see here in Scripture, the crazy thing is, all that happens before the resurrection of, of Lazarus. I find that so interesting to me. It's just because Jesus was really laying the foundation for what was going to happen. And that same thing happens with us in the church. That if we want to have healing, we want to have restoration, we want to have all these things that God's going to do in our life, so many of those things happen through relationships. So if we want those things, we have to build the community first. We have to have relationships first. We have to start discipleship first. And through that process is where we will find the healing. That's when we find the restoration, maybe even resurrection. Because God works through the church. God works through community here. That's why God set up the church. It's not that you're doing this alone. You're doing it in community with other believers here. I want to continue reading in verse 39. Finally, Jesus is going to heal somebody, right? It says, 39, it says, Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you to believe that you will see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, and his feet and hands were wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth on his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Today we hear this, this, this phrase, Take away the stone. And I think that's the question that Jesus is asking each one of us. What stone do we have in our lives that is preventing us from community? What stone in, in front of our lives do we have us that's preventing us to having reaching out other generations, reaching out to our youth, to answering and, and discussing the hard questions, to opening up with our emotions? What stone do we have in our lives? What stone do you have in the way that's preventing you from joining a small group, from getting involved in the youth ministry? What stone's in the way from getting you involved in the children's ministry downstairs? <clears throat> what stone is in your life that's preventing you from coming to fully, passionately follow Jesus? Because Jesus is saying, take away the stone. Because without the stone removed, Lazarus cannot come out of that grave. And it's the same with us. Unless that we remove the stone in our heart, Jesus can't come in and have that relationship with us, and we can't have a relationship with his community here at the church. Take away the stone is what God is calling and asking us to this very moment. I'm going to finish out just reading the, the two sections, or well, actually just one section of Scripture that I, did, I skipped over, and it's vitally important, but I'm just going to let this conversation end, and then we'll close out with prayer. I'm going to pick up in verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me lives, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Then I'm going to jump down to 43. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let us pray. Dear Father, we come before you. In the very words we're reading, you are asking each one of us to do to believe that you are the resurrection and the life. That 
You are the answer. By following you, you give us what we need. But Lord, we place stones. We place other things that help prevent us from following you, prevent us from being in community, preventing us from serving. And God, help us roll away that stone and so that we can fully embrace this new life that you give us, which is yourself. And then we could take off those grave clothes and be free to follow you. Sing your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.